Okay, it is five o'clock. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining the AFBE Leadership Talk Show. This is 2022, the first talk show that we're hosting in the year 2022. I feel like giving ourselves a, a round of applause. We survived 2021, which was, I believe, a very great year for, for most of us. There were loads of challenges, but if you're alive and you are here, it means you overcame. So it's lovely seeing the beautiful faces in the house and seeing everyone here. Thank you for joining this uh, talk show where we introduce Transcend and we talk about some of the issues that we has been faced in the industry. And with me, I have a lovely set of panelists, people who have worked with me for the past two years, who have advised me and who have worked as a team to generate material content that we believe will be very effective in progressing effective leadership, not just in the industry, but in our lives as a whole. Thank you everyone for joining. It's been a pleasure having you guys here. Um, just for introduction's sake, I will go through each of the panelists and I would ask you to introduce yourself. I would go accordingly from the top of my screen. If you can just introduce yourself, just a short intro and so people know who you are. Some of you are very familiar faces. You've been here. This is not your first time on this talk show. So it'll be good to hear from you. I'll start with Mavis on my left. Nice to meet you. Please introduce yourself again for the audience. Thanks, Roy, and lovely to be here, everyone. I'm Mavis Anabroso. I'm the Global Head of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in Harbour Energy. I also sit on the Oil and Gas UK Diversity and Inclusion Task Group. Thank you very much, uh, Mavis. Um, Emma? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma O'Para. I'm a legal advisor with Centrica Storage Limited and basically just uh, manage the effective risk, risk, well, risk management with the um, senior leadership team of that company. Thank you very much, Emma. Diane? Hi, I'm Diane Chadwick-Jones. I work for BP as the Director of Human Performance in the area of safety and in culture. And I was involved in the creation of BP's framework for action on racial injustice, uh, which has made a lot of changes in BP and across the industry. And it's great to be here. Thank you very much, Diane. I'm Abby. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Abhi Goswami, I'm the global team lead for subsurface workflows at Shell. And uh, I have been with AFBE with the leadership program, helping Roy and the team build it up from scratch. So great to be here. Thank you. Ami. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ami Singh. I am the head of operations for Belfort Beatty in Scotland. Uh, I'm a chartered engineer, fellow of IET professional registration advisor and also volunteer with AFBE as well. Thank you. And finally, my co-host, Bumi. Hi, everyone. My name is Bumi Olabi. I'm a remote operation shift manager at BOC Linde. Um, and I'm a key member of um, AFBE. So I'll be co-hosting today as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Lovely set of panelists. I, in fact, I, I feel very honored to have all of you as part of team in the AFBE team. Um, so just let's jump straight into it. We're here to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. And it's good for us to understand why this is important. Over the past one year plus, almost two years now, we've been creating content around Transcend and how Transcend can be of help to people of color in the industry? How can we promote a more diverse board in the industry? These are very key issues that affects generally anybody who's of color. Uh, Emma, I would like to start with you. Can you give us a little bit of introduction as to why do we have these issues in the industry? What are the issues that already exist? And how can we work to tackle them? 
Well, I think it, it goes even beyond the industry to the wider society. Um, the truth is, and I'm sure we're all aware, representation by any one group does not an inclusive environment make. So whether it is um, gender or race, age or social economic status, you have to have a, a wider, um, you have to embrace a wider group of people in order for us to all feel included. Now, statistics have shown that there has been progress made on boards of FTSE 350 companies to include more women in leadership, but those same statistics are also showing that that progress is happening at a far slower rate for ethnic diversity. And that is the challenge. The slowness of that progress is a challenge. On the one hand, you know, we may talk about awareness all we want, but on the other hand, what else is missing? I think the understanding of how to gain momentum is what is also missing from the people, well, amongst the people who are excluded. Um, in 2017, the UK government commissioned a report to look into ethnic diversity and enriching business leadership. Now that report, I think some of us probably are quite familiar with this. It's known as the Parker Review. And it found at the time that over half of the FTSE 100 companies did not have directors, um, directors from ethnic diverse backgrounds. When total directorships were looked at, it was found that non-white directors were found to be only 8% of the larger number. And that led to a recommendation that said, right, by 2021, all FTSE 100 companies will have to have at least one director from a minority background. And for the FTSE 250 companies, I think it was 2024, that was going to be their deadline. Now, by February 2020, an update to that Parker review showed that 39% of FTSE 100 companies still didn't have at least one director of, of color. I'm talking of just one director of color. And that's 39% of your FTSE 100 companies. For FTSE 250 companies, that gap was even wider. It was about 69% of them that didn't even have a director of color. Um, I'm sure we all know that 2020 was an important year. It was like a watershed moment for direct um, diversity initiatives that cut across all areas of society. So probably for that reason, or maybe not, by March 2021, it was good to see that seven more FTSE 100 companies had reported that they had now appointed directors from ethnic minority background. But why am I saying all of this? Progress is still so slow. And therefore we ourselves need to cut away the reasons for that sort of snail's pace and get into the target. And what does that mean? We have to actively present candidates for leadership. So that now takes the focus from what's happening out there to a more inward um, look into how we can bring our whole selves into our careers, into our workspaces. How are we enhancing our potential? You know, for me, it's down to three questions. What is the goal, which we've sort of summarized at the start of this, and we will go into throughout this. What are the tools that we need? And are we ready? Are we actually prepared to grasp those tools once they become more accessible and more available to us? For me, that's what the Transcend Leadership course makes available for anyone who's seeking to create that fairer, more balanced workspace. You, you have to start to look at yourself as the person who makes the change that you want to see. So from what you're saying, in as much as there's a very slow pace of progression of people of color in boardrooms, or at least in executive roles, there's an onus on us, a responsibility that we have to attain to. We have to take that ownership and responsibility to be able to almost, let's say, push yes. so that there's a push and there's a pool at the same time within the industry. Because if, if that doesn't exist, then that means it will go at the pace of the organization or the institution and, and however it has been run exactly. Absolutely. And, and for Roy, there's some, for me, there's something I call the, um, the gratitude syndrome that I think affects a lot of people from minority backgrounds. We look at ourselves and we look at where we've, you know, arrived at. We look at, we look at what we've achieved in, um, in an environment that isn't widely reflecting people that look like us. And we say to ourselves, well, you know, we've done good work and we've gotten here and 
maybe this is enough. And I, I don't say that to discount the incredible amount of personal achievement that it's taken to get you to that point. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, are we holding ourselves to lower standards than we may be entitled to? Um, and of course, now that we're in a pivotal moment in society, are we grasping, are we standing still or are we, you know, trying to change so that we're able to grasp the opportunities that are now more available? Interesting. Gratitude syndrome, that's something I'm going to start uh, probably using or looking up more. Uh, Mavis, if I may call on you, Emma has said a very few key things here, and, and I believe with your new role, you, you're the diversity and, and inclusion global lead in, in, in our organization. But before that, you have personally been involved in, in this particular space. And I believe we've also had a talk on diversity at the boardroom. What's your take on this? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Roy. Um, so, so my take on this is um, the issues we see around sort of diversity at boardroom level, um, they are systemic, unfortunately. And so we need a systemic approach to dealing with this issue. Um, Transcend is, you know, is, is a fantastic idea to, to equip people with the right level of skills to get to that point for promotion and so on. But if I, if I like to take a step back um, for us, and let's let's look back at sort of university entry level, for instance. So over you know the last sort of ten years, like between I think 2013 and 2017, 18 uh, academic session, the number of sort of non-white um, students in you know university increased by 60 percent, which was fantastic. And if you look at you know um, people of sort of black and ethnic minority origin, it was above 26 percent, so over a quarter of them. But the funny thing, it's not really funny is those 26%, some of them seem to vanish between you know, leaving university and getting into industry. Because um, in industry, we only have, I think it's about 7.8% 7, of engineers are black. You know, they're from that ethnic minority group. So what happens to the other people who, has who have graduated from, from engineering degrees? I happen to have spoken to quite a few of them recently um, over the last year when I was conducting some personal research finding out more about the lived experiences of, of Black uh, and, and native minority engineers up and down the country. And some few things I found really saddened me, one of them being that, you know, that sort of presumption around your sort of competency levels. People see you and assume you're not really good enough. You have to prove yourself as I'm an engineer, I'm a reservoir engineer, I'm a metering expert and so on and so forth. Um, so you feel like you have to work twice as hard and it's exhausting. So when you go to work every day, and you feel like you need to prove yourself constantly in every single meeting you, you enter, in every single project you join. Um, it limits you. And after a while, it starts to chip away at you and your confidence level goes. I spoke to someone who's got a PhD. He's got over 20 years work experience. He's based down in England. And he's just resigned himself that he's just going to continue working as a standard reservoir engineer for the rest of his career. He's like, you know what, I'm, I, that's what I'm going to do. There's no point fighting the system anymore. And what you see as well is people career hop, so they move from one job to the other, one company to the other, because that's the only way you can get promotion. So transcend is not going to solve everything, you know, because as Emma has said before, I think it was you that said it, we need a push and a pull as well. But this is an important step in the, in the fact that you're taking things into your own hands in the sense of joining a program that will equip you with skills that you may have missed out on from say personal experiences, because if you're working in industry and someone gives you a tap on the back and say, hey, I, I need you to join this project, you have an opportunity. But if you don't have the opportunity that allows you to develop those skills, then this is a good way of, of sort of getting in there. Well, on the other hand, we also need industry to sort of take some decisive steps in this area and actually do things. Hold your business leaders accountable. And I can't say that often enough. It's not enough to just make statements about we're committed to our people, we'll do this, we'll do that. We encourage, you know, openness and fairness and equity. No, hold them accountable. What are you actually going to do? Especially when you see things like ethnicity pay gap, gender pay gap, and so on. You know, why are there no people of color on in the, on the leadership team? So these are the sort of questions we should be asking. And I'll stop here so that uh, other people can get a chance to talk as well. Very interesting. Um, one thing I picked up on, hold your business leaders accountable, because I believe if, if they're not held accountable, then it means it's, there's always a likelihood that they can come, they can make very beautiful statements, but that ends there. 
They can host conversations internally, but he ends there. So when we start to hold them accountable, then it means there's almost a sort of opportunity that we start to create for ourselves because now they need to be responsible. Um, I'm going to switch to Ami now. I mean, you've personally had such an experience. I mean, I've, I've watched your career over one year and I think over one year, you've changed jobs simply because of this lack of opportunity to progress within your workspace, within your organization, into a leadership role, even after you've acquired so much, um, let me say, accolades within your organization. Can you tell us more? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I worked for a FTSE 100 organization, um, joined the organization six years ago. I was very fortunate enough to uh, to be recognized as a, as a technical leader, I was joined as an electrical engineer, uh, was recognized for my technical skill sets, was promoted to a lead engineer within a two year time frame, and then to an engineering manager, uh, managing a large infrastructure team of multidisciplinary engineers of 35 odd engineers in my team for multidisciplinary assets. Uh, it, I was well known within the organization uh, for my technical contribution, uh, published over 35 papers, so well known in the industry. Uh, and, and I made my intentions quite clear that I wanted to progress within the organization and I wanted to stay within the organization. There was the two drivers that made quite, myself quite clear and to the organization itself. And at this point, it's quite important to note based on the other speakers that have also mentioned, there's two types of engineers that you get, ones who are content with the current roles and ones who want to grow. Uh, and the growing could be financially driven, it could be career aspirational driven. And mine was definitely an aspirational driven. A career goal that I wanted to progress with an organization that I really cared for. Uh, and after applying at multiple positions, uh, going through several leadership courses, etc., I was unable to obtain a leadership position for managing 200 plus individuals. And I tried on, on multiple occasions and, and I was unsuccessful. And what was bitter truth, and that was the fact that I didn't get any feedback on what was lacking. Uh, so at that time, I decided that it was time to seek direct conversation with the MD of the business as well. And I did not get any clear intentions of where, where the skill sets gaps were or what they had in mind for myself, which is a, a quite um, a painful thing for, a, for an employee to hear that there is no growth plans for an individual. Um, and that's when I decided to take things in my own hand. And as individuals, as engineers, uh, as leaders, we often get too comfortable in a position uh, and the organization you work for. So I decided to test my boundaries uh, and being in, a, being in an organization for 16 odd years, being in the industry for 16 odd years, you have very transferable skills from project management to construction, to asset management, to operations. So I decided to um, move, move organizations. I worked as a plant manager in an energy, energy from waste business, uh, decided that was not for me. And now I work um, for a construction industry, manage a team of 300. Uh, very content in my current role. Um, but what I learned throughout the process was it's important to not let any, anyone else define your boundaries. You make your own boundaries and and you understand your own self-worth if others don't uh, and you test test that yourself. Very interesting. Um, I mean, maybe I'm saying this because I, I understand your position from a personal point of view. But ultimately, there's something you said. You, I think you took the first step so speaking to the senior leadership within your organization, and if I believe, I believe it was a CEO or somebody within that. That's right, the MD, yep. The MD of the organization. So that means if you didn't even take that step to speak with him, you would have stayed in your, let's say, pretty much comfortable role with a, with a, with a fat paycheck, and you would have just stayed there for the next couple of years without any almost progression. Exactly. Yes, it, it, there is very stagnant um, position. You, there, unless you ask for it, nobody comes to give you a pat on the back for the next next role. So, uh, it, it is very stagnant. Stag I would have been stagnant there even until today. So that means you need to be very responsible to understand what your self worth is as an individual, and what you're bringing to the table for you to evaluate where your current situation and your current well, role is as to where you want to be in the future. That's right, yeah. So I have pretty much mapped out my five-year growth plan. Uh, I constantly review it on a timely basis and I uh, came to a resolution that 
if if I'm not good enough now, I'll never be good enough to be in this organ in the particular organization to manage a large team of 200 plus. So I decided that it was time to move on. Interesting. Now, I am going to switch to one of our very interesting panelists. Um, he's been very much involved in the creation of Transcend and almost reviewing most of the contents um, with other team members. Abby Goswami, if you can, based on what we've heard so far, we've, we've heard from Emma, we've heard from Mavis about what the situation is in the industry, the, the slow pace of progression with regards to getting into that executive management roles and opportunities for, for people of color and understanding almost from Ami's story, the steps that he has taken, intentionally taken, if I may add, to, to be able to progress his, his career. What can you tell us about how this relates in, in, in its entirety to the Transcend program and, and, and how can, do you think Transcend can help to get people from where they are to where they want to be within the organization? Sure, Roy. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to what uh, Mavis said and I'll pick one thing out of that. She, she referred to a gap where students graduating seems to be disappearing and not making it to that engineer, you know, that we would love to see them. Um, I will refer to the other gap, which is on the board of FTSE 100 companies. Now, as of last year, 1.5% of the companies had representation from people who identified themselves as VAME versus the population, which is actually 14%, which is a huge difference when you think of it, purely in terms of representation. So there is a gap at the entry level and there is a gap further down the line at the top leadership level. And that is where I would like to bring transcend into, into the discussion. And what is leadership and how can we demystify it? What are the core qualities that we need? Is it just, you know, every time we hear leadership, we hear charisma, power to communicate, telling a compelling narrative, and so on and so on. Um, is it only relevant if you have followers? What is the difference? Sometimes people lazily interchange leading and managing. So where are they different? Now, if you just go by code, you could go to something serious like articulating visions, embodying values, and creating an environment within which things can be accomplished to something which is plain, straightforward, blunt. The art of getting someone to do something you want done because he wants to do it. This is not me, this is from Eisenhower. So as you can see from this, leadership means different things to different people. At Transcend, we aim to touch upon all these aspects and go beyond. The course framework is structured to deliver what should be an inspirational program around practical leadership ability. It doesn't matter whether you are a new leader, somebody who works in the front line, you have recently become a team leader or a supervisor. This program is designed for you and it'll provide you with practical tools and techniques to motivate, inspire, and manage. Let me give you some examples. Looking inwards, how would you recognize your own unconscious bias and what constitutes limiting behavior? How would you strengthen your own communication skills to better articulate your views. And when you have to call out behaviors and performance that is detrimental to the organizational culture. How, how do having role models and addressing any gaps in your coaching skills, your mentoring skills and your negotiation skills will play a role in sharpening what is brand new. Transcend as a program is built on the experience of a team of industry experts, some of 
them are here today. In their day jobs, they work as managers and supervisors in their organization with decades. I mean, collectively, we probably have more than 100 years of work experience. It is designed to develop the confidence and competence from budding BAME leaders to fulfill their potential with their, with their leadership role on a day-to-day -day basis. We will also provide an understanding on how to adapt, how to connect and lead a whole team of different kinds of personalities. Because every team, I have yet to encounter uh, a team where every it's like a monolithic block. So we have different personalities, how you deal with them. And how are we going to do it? We're going to do it through a series of interactive and collaborative presentations, case studies, self-reflection, and group activities. We will work through each of these themes that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, they're all going to be structured in modules. And definitely what we would endeavor to do that when you, when you leave this session, you identify avenues for self-development um, and, and find areas of improving your interpersonal skills and also create a set of personal action plans for future leadership challenges. This is what we aim with Transcend. I feel like I should sign up myself already. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, are on board. <laughs> you've mentioned a couple of key things there, yeah. and I think is very crucial because I believe one of the aims of Transcend as well is to create a safe space. Yes. You, want, you want people to open up. You want people to talk. You want people to face their fears, their internal challenges and limitations, which far too often poses a barrier to them progressing into these leadership roles. And it's so ingrained that you don't even realize it. Well, not until someone starts having that conversation with you, then you now all of a sudden realize that actually it exists. I have it. So how can I overcome this and how can I challenge this? How can I change this? Which I think is very important. Yeah. The other topics I would like us to go through, but um, I would want to throw a question just, and I would want anybody who, who within, within the panelists to, to, to answer this. Now, Emma has a bit touched on this, I believe. Um, Diane actually touched on this in her introduction um, as she contributed to an action plan within VP. Mm -hmm. and, and also everyone has almost touched on this, but I, I want it to be clear because it, it feels like it's not clear in my head yet. And, and I want us to have that bit of clarity. What is the industry specifically doing about these challenges that we're facing with getting a bit more diverse people in the boardroom. Diane, please. Yeah, so well, I can speak for BP and, and it's all published, okay? So you can just look on the internet, BP Framework for Action on Racial Injustice. Um, so, uh, I mean, the point that, that Mavis made about accountability and the point that Emma made about that companies are just a reflection of society and society is racist, that you know, those have been embraced by BP. And so I just give three things very, very quickly. Holding to account, publishing numbers, and having aspirations for representation, 25% across the board in the UK, for example, for, uh, for which would be 25% representation of, of ethnic minorities. Um, also changing the way we recruit. So uh, diverse candidate slates compulsory, diver diverse interview panels compulsory from 2021 onwards, um, and, all, um, and also a, a talent program um, for, for people who are racially diverse to, to, to basically um, try and counteract the structural disadvantaging that exists within the company that is recognized that it exists within the company um, and of course looking outside uh, looking to recruitment consultancies like Orderless um, uh, who also specialize led by Suki Sandhu 
who also specialize in diverse recruits. So those are some of the practical things that are going on. Yes, I, 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 I understand that it's just BP that I'm talking about, but BP has published all of this and is holding itself to account by publishing its numbers every year and also doing the ethnicity pay graph as well. That's very interesting. So that's one front end or forward thinking organization. Now that's just one in the pack of many. Yeah, I understand that. So that means whatever the case is, if with your action framework, there's an opportunity for replication. There's an opportunity for other companies to either replicate or adopt or adopt certain elements of this into their organizations. Um, the reality is, do they care? Are they doing any of this? Mavis, maybe you? <laughs> I'm in an interesting position, Roy, uh, which is I'm in the middle of developing our strategy for, for diversity, equity and inclusion in hardware energy. So uh, I, I can't really discuss the specifics of that yet. But what I can tell you is any company that's serious in this space needs to start with a bold commitment. So they need to make a statement, a clear statement about what they intend to do. Um, you don't always have to submit aspirational targets but certainly setting out your intent to your workforce, uh, it just puts you in a slightly different league from making generic uh, tokenistic statements like we care about our workforce, we're an inclusive employer of choice and things like that. I've mentioned that already. So for me, yeah, the, the number of things that any sort of decent company needs to do, and the first one starts from establishing a baseline. You need to collect data. Because, you know, if you don't measure it, how are you supposed to know if you're improving and if you're changing things? Some people are just sort of burying their head in the sand and refusing to acknowledge, for instance, there's an ethnicity pay gap. There is clearly an ethnicity pay, pay gap. There is a gender pay gap, for instance. So if you measure it, then you know what areas you need to focus on because people don't seem to realize there's an issue. You need to look at your demographics across the organization, start from your CEO minus one level. Okay, how many people of color are there? None, okay, CEO minus two, and so on and so forth. And then ask yourself, challenge your leadership team, challenge your board, why are there no people of color? you know, at senior levels, uh, are they not good enough or, or what? And, and this leads me to a point I wanted to pick on from, from what Abby said earlier on, and it's about exposure. So exposure is critical for success in any organization. I mean, how do you develop leaders? By giving them exposure. Someone in the mid twenties, guess what? You've got this broadening assignment, you go to Iraq or you go to Nigeria or somewhere. You live there for three, four years, guess what? Suddenly you're managing 500 people and so on. By the time you get to the UK, because of that exposure, you're now in a slightly different league from a 25 year old engineer that's still at his desk, you know, writing on spreadsheets. So that exposure, because we don't organically tend to get it because of obviously bias that exists and anyone that says bias doesn't exist should go and look at the data. Um, what a program that Transcend does is inorganically, it's helping you get that exposure by taking the experience of people that have experience in different areas and allowing you to develop that exposure. And one thing I think is quite critical to emphasize is people in this sort of, you know, BAME category, they're not broken. So this program is not meant to fix you. It's just meant to broaden your horizon and give you that exposure that you may not get at work. But it's just one piece to the puzzle. The second side is businesses need to actually do something. I cannot emphasize that enough. Take tangible steps to make a difference. That's very interesting. Exposure is key. So, and what I get from you is if you can't get the exposure from your organization, you can certainly come to almost a, a transcend environment and get an exposure from other people who have been able to, um, let me say, have greater responsibilities within, the, within their roles. Ami, what do you think about that? It's great. I think if I had that exposure, when I was working in a FTSE 100 organization, I wouldn't have to go through that self, that self uh, confidence issue that you face after a number of times when you get rejected. So having exposure of, of, uh, of speaking up, budding up, being coached, being mentoring, being exposed to a lot of the elements that, that Mavis has talked about and, and Abby's talked about would have helped me understand what my self-worth was, possibly challenge the, the senior position. 
uh, and, and ask those questions that why are we not seeing more executive diversity in, in executive positions? So it would have been a very timely course uh, a couple of years ago for myself or a year ago. Thank you. Um, to the audience, please don't be shy. If you have questions, if you have burning questions, please ask, post it in the chat group and we'll be able to pick it up from there. Now, talking about that level of exposure, I would go to one of our other panelists who is actually involved in the mentoring side of it. Um, I think we missed her on when we were doing the initial introductions. So Joy, are you there? For some reason, she keeps disappearing on my screen. Um, <laughs> and I think that's why I missed you. So my apologies, no, if you can introduce no, yourself, no. that would be great. Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Joy Egoge. I'm a petroleum engineer by background, and I'm currently working with Spirit Energy as a category manager for wells and subsurface. I'm also the ethnicity ch um, chair for Spirit Energy as well, and as Rory said, also um, involved in developing the mentoring module for the Transcend program. So, um, Joy, following what has been said one way to be able to transfer experience is through mentorship and actually even sponsorship within an organization um, tell us more about for example this mentorship side of it why do we need mentors i think that, i think we should start from there because i find too often that not many people are confident enough to either approach mentors or even see the need to have a mentor. I, I will quote uh, uh, someone who, who said, I am not weak. <laughs> so, so, so if, 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 and, and I believe there's quite a few people there who think that having a mentor is a sign of weakness. So can, can you tell us more about why do we need mentors? Oh, absolutely. I think in terms of mentorship, it really transcends across the individual industry and the organization. So. What I'll say is, first of all, if we start and we look at the oil industry, for example, right, we see that there are a lot of concerns over skill shortages, especially because it's linked to reduced margins, aging workforce, and also competition from other sectors. Now, mentoring is one method of supporting an individual's professional development because it really ensures that the skills and the knowledge that's gained through individual experience can be passed down to the next generation of personnel. In fact, it actually complements other forms of training as well and helps the individual to build other skills, soft skills such as confidence and leadership skills. So it's definitely beneficial to both the mentor and the mentee. So that's something that we need to understand as well. So on the mentee side, we're looking at helping them better manage their career goals. Um, I mentioned before, obviously, confidence and self-awareness are things that they also gain from it. But one of the things which is critical, especially from BAME um, individuals, is that it helps develop a wide network of influence as well and helps achievement of all your developmental outcomes. I think one interesting thing, if I were to link the Transcend program into mentorship, is that we're really sharing different ways and really trying to highlight the fact that things like sponsorship is really, really critical in tackling the gap and the misrepresentation of BAME employees in the workplace at very senior levels. That's really critical. We're trying to link leadership and mentorship. So not only just seeing mentorship as, oh, I'm developing myself, but also how you can develop as a leader through mentorship. Um, one of the things which, again, I'm really passionate about as well with sponsorship is, I think I would really challenge BAME individuals out there First of all, with Transcend, you will educate them more about sponsorship, but also challenge them to see how they can also pull others up. Obviously, there are a lot of, of things. I think for me, it's a lived experience as well. What I find is some people are, you know, of BAME employees that are very high level. They're like, oh, you know, if I try and, you know, spotlight someone who actually is talented, oh, it would be as though I'm, you know, helping another person who's like me. And, I feel almost as though they're shying away from that. But the truth of the matter is that is really what we need. So we each have a responsibility, one for our own personal development, but also spotlighting and highlighting talent of, of BAME individuals that really deserve to be projected forward. 
So I think those are the, are the key things um, that I would say about the mentorship um, program. You're on mute, Roy. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to mute <laughs> okay. myself. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, there's something you mentioned, which I think is quite key. You're not just learning, but also if giving yourself an opportunity to create a wide network of influence. Mm -hmm. And I think influence is very key if you want to progress in the industry. If, if your influence or let's say your, um, uh, well, I don't know what word to use again, influence is not felt within the organization, it becomes very difficult to progress into leadership roles. And I think another benefit of having a mentor is, apart from you learning from them, you almost have a mouthpiece when you're not in the room. I believe so. And that goes for both sponsorship and mentorship, depending on if you're in the same organizations or, 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 or without. And that means you have the opportunity for people to speak for you in the room when you're not even there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Emma, you seem to agree very much. Tell us more about this. I think it's, it's so important. And I think my early experience in the industry has shown me how vital it is because I obviously, you know, uh, being a migrant in a country where I had to, first of all, build my professional network. I always joke to people that being a lawyer and moving from one jurisdiction to the other is, you know, basically just starting from scratch when it comes to, you know, knowing people who can do things for you. But yes, you're building your professional networks and then you're also trying to progress. And obviously not having access to certain rooms meant that I had to rely on the people in those rooms to speak up and speak out for me. And I remember, I always remember the conversation I had with one of the companies that I left when I was uh, making a career move for the same reasons that Amy highlighted, i.e. I felt I was ready for the jump and other people didn't. So I was speaking during my exit interview and I said to them, I have never seen anyone in the company who looks like me above this level. And I am surprised that you as a company also don't recognize the fact that um, there is obviously a ceiling that I can get to, first of all, as a migrant in your community, and second of all, as a woman as well. So I think that gave them, hopefully that gave them something to think about. But even making that statement, I also had to recognize the fact that I was only able to progress the mid-management in the first place, because the people who recognized my ability were able to make those opportunities available to me. So, you know, it, it's so it's so important. You know, people holding doors open for us are not always going to look like us. And that's where the mentoring and the coaching um, elements is, is, is vital for us. First of all, to understand how we can do that for other people and create those opportunities when we are in pos positions that we are the ones holding the doors but also identifying where we need to look. We need to maybe outside of the organization, maybe in another industry completely, but you need to look for people who are able to tell you, the, you know, teach you the tools or give you a hint as to why you're not making it past this level and mm -hmm. what they had to contend with. And, you know, all of that is, it's, it's all, you know, we're giving and we're taking. We're receiving the information, but we're also trying to make sure that the people that we're working with are aware of you know why coaching is necessary in the organization e to c e to c that's very interesting and i think it's very important people who can leave the door open for you or at least direct you or lead you um diane i've had various and many conversations with diane and for one i know she's not just an ally she's she's an active sponsor within within her organization and i think you've actively sponsored people or at least helped them through the door. Can you tell us more about what it entails not to be a sponsor within an organization and how best can we manage that relationship? What should we be looking for in a sponsor? Well, f first of all, somebody who has influence in terms of who's going to be seen not get onto recruitment panels or to um to have influence of suggesting people for roles and that so you have to put that together with then getting to know that person and so i've seen it both ways where i've had a 
sponsors who I've got to know, I've approached them and I've asked them, if you, will you be my sponsor? I'm really interested in going to that particular part of the company um, and then get to know them a bit and then they can actually advocate for me. At the same time, I've had people or I've approached people or got to know people and said, well, you know, I, I, you know, I want to know more about you and then I, I can actually speak on your behalf. So it, it works both ways. But in both of these cases, there's a bit of putting yourself out there. And let me, I know you, you all know this takes a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of, of kind of forcing myself to do it. Oh, um, and you forcing yourself to do it, but it's really worthwhile because you just never know when that conversation is going to be about we need this you know, drilling manager and you go, oh, well, okay, have, have you considered, have you considered Amy? And it's, it's that kind of, I, I know it sounds so informal, but it's all about the Transcend program, how you build your brand and how you show your brand to those potential sponsors that's very interesting i like I, I really like what you said maybe that's because you're quite proactive because you didn't just have a sponsor but you went out there to get a sponsor so that means there needs to be that intentional push to seek a sponsor within your organization but what happens if you tried and no one's responsive to you in that organization well, I think it's about looking for people who you've already worked with. So that makes it less scary and it makes it almost impossible for them to say no. Because it, you, you, for example, you've done a, a presentation to senior leadership um, and then you and they have seen what you do and then you approach them. So it's it, sometimes people might say no because they just don't know enough about you. So it's about who who has seen my work, who has seen what I can do, and then approach them. So there needs to be that relationship building to gain trust on both yeah. ends, basically. Yeah. And, and it makes it easier for them to say, well, do you remember Diane or Amy who did that great presentation or who, who did that great project? And they go, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. So it, 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 there, it, there's some evidence-based um, uh, influencing and advocating going on here. Interesting. Thank you very much. Mavis, I'll come to you. I believe there's a business case for why companies should promote diversity in the boardroom. And, and that's because a more diverse organization from statistics perform way better by way of bottom line revenue and all of that than their peers. How can we take active steps to promote this diversity? Yeah, so there's several things um, companies can do and I've already touched on it a, a little bit earlier on. Um, the first one for me is um, making that commitment and that commitment has to start right from the top. I'm talking board level, board level commitment and CEO commitment. And that's the reason why I, I accepted the role for, for Harbor Energy, because there was that commitment from the board and also from the CEO of the company. And that was all I needed. And once I have that, I know that setting the strategic, strategic direction would be a lot easier than when you're trying to convince them and sell the business case to them. So when you have that commitment, you need to start by measuring um, you cannot be serious about increasing or improving diversity in your company and then just go off sort of shooting from the hip doing one sort of training and different initiatives you know, without any sort of strategic sort of direction. You need to start by measuring. You know, um, a lot of companies in the oil and gas industry do not actually um, collect demographic data of employees beyond what is statutorily uh, required. So age and gender, that's as far as people have. A lot of companies do not have breakdown by ethnicity, for instance. They're like, oh, how do we ask that sort of question? It's quite sensitive. The thing is, um, have you actually asked? <laughs> because uh, I doubt there are lots of people out there that would say, no, I'm not going to tell you I'm black, even though I'm obviously black. Um, collect that data. When you collect the data, then start measuring how much are people earning? How many people who have you know, ethnic minority origins 
are in leadership positions. How long does it take people from entry level to get promotion? You know, because um, in terms of promotion generally, one thing people don't realize is whenever you have a new hire, there's almost like an unspoken premium on that new hire. And that's because you're taking a risk. It's a gambit. You're taking a risk on someone because you don't know if they'll perform or not. That premium, believe it or not, has been done by people much more clever than, than me in Harvard University. That premium is a lot higher for people from minority groups, especially from people from ethnic minority groups. So with a higher premium, it's, it's more difficult for someone to take that chance on you, that, that risk, that gamble on you. So what you need to do is to educate your leadership so they are intentional about selecting people and taking a chance on them, same way you would select uh, people and take a chance of them if, if they were not you know, an ethnic minority um, um, population. So, so that's the third thing, so um, establishing your baseline. And then you need, to, you need to build a strategic framework for diversity, equity and inclusion. So again, this is not about unconscious bias training and there's nothing wrong about you know, that course, there's nothing wrong with you know, training, but asking a bunch of people to sit down for a two hour course on unconscious bias and how we're all biased, it's not gonna change the dial. It's not gonna get people through the door. You know, the 17% that managed to make it through the door, it's not gonna get them promoted. You need more than training. So you need to set a goal in terms of your hiring practices, performance management, the entire employee life cycle framework, everything needs to be looked at, even how you work with your suppliers, you need to look at that as well. And then finally, you need to monitor and review and you need to be held accountable by the board. So you cannot be a DNI lead or manager or whatever, and you just go off, do your work, produce a few glossy reports from time to time, and then you just go off, you know, happy days. No, you need to monitor, review, you know, what you're doing and present it to the board, present it to the workforce so that they see that you're actually serious about making a difference. Because if even a quarter of people in the industry start doing this, you start to see, you know, incremental changes in terms of attracting people from diverse, you know, backgrounds. Thank you very much. Um, Bumi, I believe okay. you've got a question. Yes, we have. Um, so um, there's a question from Dr. Ole. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I'll just throw it open to anyone within the panel. Um, we, have, we often talk about the impacts that systemic and institutional racism has on representation at board level. But what role, um, sorry, just hold on. What role does the panel believe, what role does the panel believe that internalized racism. That internalized racism plays in limiting the progress of minority ethnic workers, e.g., self deselection, lifting the ladder as soon as we've climbed in, and actually seeking help from successful people within the organization, within our community. So that's this question. I don't know if that was clear. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, to to have a go with that question. Thanks, Oli, for, for the question. Um, Systemic and institutional racism uh, exists, it's a fact. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I say you need a systemic approach to address this, this issue. You need to call it out. Um, and it starts by you know, highlighting what is wrong, highlighting the problem, highlighting it, show, holding up the mirror to, to your board, holding up the mirror to your CEO to tell them these are the issues we're facing. People say, oh, I hate positive discrimination and all that. I'm not saying you know pick every person of color and promote them. All I'm saying is you should challenge yourself and ask yourself, if I'm giving an opportunity to Tom or someone else in the team, have I thought broadly in terms of, is there anyone else in the team that could benefit from that opportunity? Because your ability to do jobs is not usually totally a function of your competence. A part of it is about potential. If I put you in that space, would you be able to thrive and develop and acquire new skills? So. Other than calling it in and challenging your board, you know, there's, I can't think of any other easy way or a simple way of, of dealing with this. I think Abby wants to add to this as well. No, thank you, Mavis. Uh, the, the, the only thing that I wanted to bring out here is sometimes by using two different words together, we end up doing a little disservice to the cause. So here we are using the term diversity and inclusion together. And sometimes companies, not all, take the recourse of being aware of diversity and ticking the box there 
to make it a more diverse organization and back it up with lots of data to say that the DNI part is taken care of. And I will again have to take the recourse of a, a, a saying here that diversity is a reality, but inclusion is a choice. So let us make companies, organizations, individuals accountable for that inclusion spe uh, space. That's the bit I wanted to bring out. Can, can I can I also maybe just um, pipe up here to say that the second part of all this question, which is the internalized racism and you know deselecting ourselves, pulling up the ladder, etc. Would that not be a function of the scarcity mentality that a lot of us as minorities tend to bring with us to these foreign environments? Um, is that not because we are afraid that, well, because I've gotten in here, I have to be careful that I'm not booted out once I let the next person who looks like me into this same space. Therefore, a course like this, Transcend, you know, we're basically saying to everyone who is from whatever background you are, you are a leader, you have the potential to lead. You know, I, I, I want to see Transcend as it being able to broaden our mindset about who is entitled, you know, you don't look at the exceptional Black, Asian, you know, whoever it is that has managed to get into the boardroom as being any much different from you. It's that understanding of potential. I think that's what will really um, destroy that internalized racism, so to speak, that we sometimes find within our communities. Well, I, I believe this conversation is getting very interesting. Um, Oli, thank you for throwing the um, curveball in and, and a very brilliant response from, from Mavis, Emma and Abby, which I think is very key. However, I'm very conscious of time here as well. Um, so just to, to, to wrap up, the whole idea for this talk show is for us to have a bit of focus and understand where the value of Transcend is, what we're offering to the community, to the industry, and to people of color. We are not training you because you are not trained well enough. No, that's not the case but we're creating a safe space where we can come together and actually arm ourselves, where we can come together and also gain some form of experience from others who have been able to go through this process. You've heard directly from Emma, who went through that system. You've heard from Ami, who actually gave you uh, some form of idea as to the challenges he faced, the questions he asked, the steps he took to be where he is today. And all these people, you will see and hear from them in the Transcend program. Everyone who's been on the panel here is directly involved with the Transcend program. So that means we've been very careful to curate materials that will benefit each and every one of us. And so I would like to encourage each and every one of us here who feels like they are in that position where they have been almost stagnant or let me say stuck in a very technical role and haven't been able to progress past that technical role either by choice or by the system which has just almost put a lid on their progression. This is an opportunity for you to come and start to challenge yourself challenge the system, challenge the, uh, the, the, the organization that you belong to. And I think we all owe it as a sense of responsibility. Responsibilities to yourself, first of all. Responsibility to the industry, because if you are part of the industry, then you are responsible to that industry as well. And finally, responsible to posterity, because if we don't see more people like us in leadership roles, that has a way of having an impending effect on the generation coming behind us. If we don't owe it to ourselves to be responsible to also mentor them intentionally, then we're also doing ourselves a disfavor going forward. And so I would like to thank each and every one of you who's made it here today. I'd like to thank the panelists. You all have been amazing. I couldn't ask for a better team. God knows, uh, I, I look up to you guys every day. I learn from you every day. 
And I think it's been a very mutual relationship where we've all learned from each other through the past years. And so I want to also thank AFBE for giving us the opportunity because without the platform of AFBE, the reality is we will not be here today. So thank you to everyone. And to everyone who's made it here to attend this event, I'd like to say thank you. Next steps, click on the link on the AFBE link, um, which we have online, or if Bumi can post it here. Look at the brochures that we have on Transcend so you understand what we're offering and take active steps. You need to be in it, like they say, to win it with the lottery. So that means, you know, for you to progress, you need to come to a place where you have like minds and we feed off of each other. And from there, we grow together. There will be a mentorship system that will be set in place. And you would have access to people like Diane as well, people like Mavis, who can help to mentor as well going forward into the industry, which I think is very crucial. And there's many more like them who are very proactive and very intentional and very helpful as well, who we class as our allies. So if you think this is for you, I would like to encourage you to take that step, sign up for Transcend. Do not be shy. Do not think of, oh, I don't want to be first. I want to be second. No. Come first, see how it is, explore with us. It's a learning process. We would learn from you as much as you would learn from us. So don't see it as, oh, you're coming to a class to learn. No, you're coming to gain and you're coming to grow. So thank you to everyone. It's been a lovely evening today and I'm so glad that we've had this talk and we will have this talk when Transcend launches in April. Um, and also just a bit of information, we're planning for the AFBE Live, which is a conference to be held in April. Let's look forward to that. We'll be launching and showcasing the participants of Transcend in that conference. And it's an opportunity for us to come together and also learn from each other as well. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Bumi. Thank you, all the panelists. I appreciate you all. Thank you for coming in. And for all the, all, all the participants, thank you for joining in. And look forward to our next talk, which is in March. And we have an exciting host of speakers for the rest of the year. And when I say exciting, exciting host of speakers uh, coming up in, in the rest of the year. Thank you, everyone, and have Thank a good you. night.